this is a great honor for me to be here, and I, I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. The first class started here in 1825, and you know what that means. They've almost paid off their student loans. <laughs> My favorite University of Virginia story, I think, was when Professor William Reddy Eccles, trying to stop the fire that gutted the rotunda, threw 100 pounds of dynamite on the flames. It concerns me that he was a professor. <laughs> we think of them as superior knowledge and experience. I looked up what he taught. It was math. I had pretty much ruled out science or chemistry of any sort. <laughs> this is not my first time to have the honor to speak at Virginia or to walk the lawn. The first time happened when I was governor and President George H.W. Bush convened all 50 of the nation's governors here in Charlottesville, and we started here and walked to the rotunda, the 50 governors and the president. And I think the fact that this university, of all universities in this country, was picked for this unique and historic meeting of all the governors and the president to discuss education shows the regard that the excellence of this university is held in and shows its central place in American history. From its very earliest days, you've been one of America's finest. And after all, what else can you expect from Mr. Jefferson's school? It remains in that elite today. It's a testament to the faculty, the staff, the skill, the dedication, the excellence, the talent of everybody sitting here today. Students and friends, supporters. And now to the class of 2014. Congratulations to you. As you take your degree today, you have earned it. You have put in the time, you have made the effort, you have done the work. But I'm going to say what the first two speakers said, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a whole lot of people. Behind every single one of you, every single one, are parents and grandparents, siblings, teachers, coaches, friends, mentors, hundreds and hundreds of people many of whom you probably don't even know, don't even realize the role they played, who have made this accomplishment possible. Now, as the rector said, after the ceremony, and I know you're going to do this because you were going to do it anyway, and I know you're going to do it because the rector advised it, but I'm going to pile on that advisement. Give them a hug. Thank them one more time. There are certain things you can't have too many of. Hugs is one of them. Ice cream falls in that category too. <laughs> Thank them for what they've done because in a very real way, today is their day too. And it's also important to remember those who in a larger sense make days like today possible. Those who have worn and are wearing the uniform of our country. Those, those who stand the watch around the world and keep us safe and secure. The grounds here at the University of Virginia have been home to students as wide ranging as Woodrow Wilson, Edgar Allan Poe, and Tina Fey. <laughs> Two of my predecessors 
as Secretary of the Navy, Hillary Herbert and Graham Clater sat where you sit. From the military, Admiral Richard Byrd, pioneer of naval aviation and polar explorer of both poles, went to school here before he moved to the Naval Academy. So did Fleet Admiral William Bull Halsley, who helped lead our Navy Marine Corps across the Pacific in World War II, and the 18th Commandant of the Marine Corps, Alexander Vandergriff, who was awarded the Medal of Honor for his leadership in the Solomon Islands campaign, went here as well. These military greats from your history are truly extraordinary, but so too are all who serve this country. Every single person, every single person is just as professional, just as dedicated, just as skilled as those heroes of our past. We ought to be incredibly grateful to those who have made the choice to defend this unique and great country because less than 1%, 1% of America wears the cloth of America. 1% to protect the other 99% of us. 1% who have volunteered and given freely of their time and themselves for years and years. 1% who have sacrificed day after day. They are the 6,000 Marines in Afghanistan today. They are the almost 40,000 sailors deployed around the world on 100 ships that we have forward deployed at this moment. Those Marines, those sailors are in the islands of the Pacific, they're on the shores of the Black Sea, they're in Central Africa, they're in the South China Sea, they're in Northeast Asia. They're also the soldiers and the airmen in Korea and Germany. They're the Coast Guardsmen in the frigid waters of the Arctic. They went to Indonesia after the Christmas tsunami. They went to Louisiana and Mississippi after Katrina. They went to Japan after the tsunami and earthquake, to Haiti after that earthquake, to New Newark and New Jersey after Sandy, and this past winter to the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan. They are your friends, they are your brothers, they are your sisters, whether you know them or not. They are making a difference. They're doing something for others. They're doing something beyond themselves. They have endured hardships and family separations, have undertaken an incredibly high pace of operations for the past 13 years that we have been at war. Thousands have paid the ultimate price of their life. Tens of thousands more have come home with scars, visible and invisible, which they will bear with them till their final day. Those who have served and are serving are here today in many roles. As proud grandparents and parents, brothers and sisters, family members, friends, and some of them are sitting with you today. Fellow students who came back on the GI Bill or the Yellow Ribbon Program, and I was honored yesterday to commission ROTC graduates into all our services who form the next link of that unbroken chain. So I'd like to take just a minute as Memorial Day approaches a week from today to recognize the veterans who have served or who are serving, regardless of where you served or when you served, stand up or wave. Let us thank you for what you've done.
Now, the question I want to ask you graduates is will you join them? Will you serve? Will you be a part of one of the hallmarks of this great university service? Now, I'm not saying, and I certainly hope you don't have to risk your life, although we need skilled and dedicated people protecting this country. The military is far, far from the only way to serve. There are quiet acts of heroism that go on every single day. It's the teacher staying after class to help a struggling student. And who do not get paid enough to do it. <laughs> it's the act of a nurse staying on. <laughs> who also, by the way, don't get paid enough to do it. I'm saying that as someone who married a nurse. <laughs> but it's a nurse staying on after the shift is over with to comfort a patient. It's the act of mowing the grass for an elderly neighbor without being asked. Or it's the act of a father putting people through college without ever telling his family. That last thing happened to a close friend of mine who found out her father had put dozens of people through college only at his funeral. When those people came up to her to tell her how much her father had changed her lives. Now it's the service that matters. It's the service to our fellow Americans and it's the service to people in need around the world. I hope that I've learned that in my own life. I graduated from Ole Miss in 1969, the height of the Cold War and of Vietnam. And I learned as a 21-year-old naval officer what it means to be a part of a team with lives at stake, that what the actions that I took could have reverberations on the next watch or the next day, maybe the next year. So do something outside yourself. Do something to make a difference, to give back to this unique nation we are privileged to call home. Do something to help people who may never know you did it or may never know you. Do something that's not just about you or your advancement. Now there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with making money. And there's nothing wrong with seeing how far you can go in your chosen field. I assume that's the business school. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with seeing how far you can go in your chosen field. And there's nothing wrong and a whole lot right with taking care of yourself and your family. But at the end of your life, it's not going to be the money or the stuff that you've accumulated. I personally have never seen a hearse with a U-Haul. <laughs> the important things will be the people you've touched, the lives you've made better, the futures you have made brighter. I'm privileged to lead the Navy and Marine Corps, the greatest expeditionary fighting force the world has ever known. And one of the best things I get to do is talk to veterans Earlier this year, I was in the Marshall Islands, which is a series of tiny atolls in the middle of the Pacific. Seventy years ago, a task force of sailors and marines landed there during the march across the Pacific. And standing under those rusted guns, still there on the beach, I was reminded just how costly that one battle was. And while I was there, I had the great privilege to have dinner with a group of veterans who had traveled halfway across the world to remember what they'd accomplished there and remember friends they had left there. Every one of these veterans told me how important their service was, how important it was 
to do something big, to make a difference. They remembered their service like it was yesterday and seven decades had not dimmed the brilliance or the significance. I also get to meet a lot of people who aren't veterans, but remember the two years they spent teaching when they were young or the time they spent getting something they really cared about started or put into action or the trip they made and how they helped build a school or a hospital or a future for others. One thing is very certain as you go into a very uncertain world. There is no end of things that need doing. We're nearing the end of a generation that earned the title of the greatest generation. That survived the Depression, won World War II, came back to build the strongest nation the world has ever known. You have exactly the same opportunity to become a greatest generation. Lauded for your accomplishments 60, 70, 80 years from now. But to do it, you'll have to do something that will last. It doesn't have to be the Marine Corps, but like a lot of graduates from this school, take a look at the Peace Corps. You don't have to run for office, but vote. And get passionately interested and involved in the events of your time, whether they're political or not. Don't let them pass you by. Get involved in your school, your community, your city, your state, your nation. Get involved in your world. The greatest generation changed that whole world. They made it better. That's your opportunity too. And finally, I hope you will do something that you will not see the results of maybe ever. My father, Raymond Mabus Sr. was a member of that greatest generation. He was a tree farmer in Ackerman, Mississippi. We have somebody from Ackerman, Mississippi here. <laughs> this really is quite a school. <laughs> My dad died when he was 85 years old after a great life. In the last year of that life, he did not cut a single tree, but he planted thousands. Now he knew for an absolute fact that he would never see any money from those trees. He knew for an absolute fact he would never see them grow and mature. He knew for an absolute fact he would never get one bit of benefit from those trees. But he did it anyway. He did it as a matter of hope. He did it as a matter of faith. He did it for me. He did it for his granddaughters that he never met. And he did it for the generations in my family that will never know him and that he will never know. So cherish this day. Cherish your graduation because you have earned it. But when this day is over, go out and earn some things earn some things that will be cherished long after this day is gone and long after we are all gone. It's your turn. It's your life. Tomorrow, ask yourself, what trees am I going to plant? Thank you all.